Here we are, mate. Back again. Sonny, what's happening? Oh, I'm much more tired than I was last Monday. I've just gymmed. I've just had a little swim in the pool. Got a little bit of wet hair. Come straight back for the live show, which is, uh, you know, the highlight of my Monday. So, yeah, I'm good. Mate, the swimsuit guy is working on his guns, I believe. Show us these things. I, oh, they're not yours, Brett. But, uh, a second. Whoa. 90 reps. 90 reps of bicep curl. I, I mean, mm. swimmers don't bicep curl. And mm. I, so I've not done any bicep curl in years. And now mm. like, my arms are all like, oh, uh, they're all weak. Mate, but, you're getting some definition up in there. Let's let's go full screen on that just for one, one shot here. Let's go full screen. Uh, oh. look, look at that. What? Uh, we, we, can, we can check in like once a month and see the yeah. gains start to happen. Ah, oh, man, I'm going to have to get serious now. I just had a croissant for breakfast. I feel fat. I've got to get out there and uh, get out there and start lifting again. All right. Brett, your, your arms are way bigger than mine. I, I know that for a fact. Oh, we got a little guest popping in here. Here we go. Hang on a sec. Let's check her out. Megan, what's happening? Hey, how are you? How you doing? Good. What's going on? Where are you coming from? Uh, I'm coming from uh, Baku, actually. It's currently snowing outside, so it's nice to be uh, cozy and, and inside, so it's good. Yeah, I know the feeling of the snow out there in Boston. It's the same thing. Fucking uh, Baku. Sonny, have you been to Baku? <laughs> I, I haven't. I, I heard Baku, and I thought it was Baku, Azerbaijan. <laughs> I was like, what on earth is going on? Where, where are we coming from today? But it sounds just as cold. Yeah, no, that's exactly where I'm coming from, Azerbaijan. So that's, that's, uh, serious, dude. that's oh. it. Oh, okay, not Boston then. No, no. I'm in Boston. I'm in oh. Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, guys. Excuse it's me. Part of the world, set mate. Come on. Oh, yeah, I, was right. I, 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 I like got Azerbaijan. My my geography's coming in, coming in clutch here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like it. So, uh, your your podcast is actually coming out tomorrow. I put on my Instagram that it's coming out today, but I was. Uh, I was uh, quickly uh, reminded by Nate that we're on a new podcast schedule these days. So we're doing the live show on Mondays and then we do the release of the podcast tomorrow. But uh, it was fun. We had a good chat last week. Eh? Yeah, we had a great chat. Um, I, I think it's Australian time. It's nearly midnight. So you pretty much got it right. So mm. I think that it, it pretty much comes out today. But uh, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty excited to listen to it. So we love a bit of a chat and um, some chat is always good. Yeah. Now, Sonny, she's doing some commentary for swimming. We've tried this whole commentary thing. We're not very good at it. <laughs> she's, she's really good at it. Uh, I, we, we, yeah, commentary is tough. We, we just get sidetracked really easily. So we, we end up missing races just by talking about <laughs> other nonsense. Whereas, yeah, you professionals, you stay actually on track and do a good job of it. Yeah. Yeah, oh, man. I think I sometimes I, I get distracted, definitely. But uh, no, I'd, I'd love to listen to you guys. I think the more like kind of like personal you can make it, the better. So, and I love stats. I'm a bit of a nerd for swimming, so that's um that's always nice. Yeah, yeah. Now there's not there's not a lot of swimming that happened on that side of the world right now. Over in America, we have got the college swimming going on. You know, January is pretty a pretty hot month for college swimming and there's definitely some stuff going on on this side, but what does it feel like over on that side of the world where there's not much going on? Are you talking to me? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah there's um, not too much going on on this um, side of the world. There is a couple of Olympic swimmers actually uh, been chatting to them a little bit on um, Instagram. So one's actually going to uh, Arizona uh, for, she's got a college um oh, okay. she got a um yeah so she's going to college sorry um this year so that's pretty exciting for her and um oh, yeah. i mean it's not a yeah there's not too much swimming is probably not their uh, number one sport so it's not too much going on here that's right yeah like that's yeah so january is actually when i turned up for college so in 19, 1997 i left australia on christmas day and I turned up to Auburn University, but I started in January. So, yeah, there'd be a lot of uh, international college athletes basically going to college for the first time this month too, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. I'd love to – I mean, I would have – if I could turn back time, I'd love to do like a college experience. I think that's probably one of the, the things that I would have loved to uh, try and experience. In Australia, you just don't get anything like it. Um, you mm. don't get to – you know, you don't get to race every weekend. You don't, don't get to go to NCAAs and um, – I think the American system is uh, one I would have 
absolutely dreamt of, of trying to compete in. Yeah. All right, question from the audience here. What's the language spoken? Uh, it's, it's Aziri, actually. So, uh, Salam, mm -hmm. that's probably about all I can say. <laughs> Aziri, okay. I didn't even know that yeah. was a Aziri. All right. Most, uh, mo you could, like, mostly uh, Russian as well. So, if you can speak Aziri, you can nearly speak Russian. Um, I can't speak any, so English is probably going to have to do for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Sonny, what's going on, mate? What are we talking about this morning? What are we gibbering about? So the title of the show is the Tier Pro Swim Series because mm. it's happening this weekend. I think it starts on, I don't know, maybe the 12th. It's like a three-day, four-day meet. Um, it's probably the most stacked Tier Pro Series in recent years. I think the last couple of years there's been a real lack of participants, but this one features Simone Manuel, uh, Penny Alexiak, and um, I don't know, people are making a fuss because Wu Peng is swimming. He's, he's, he's back. Uh, the, the Chinese world championship medalist in the 200 butterfly from, I think, 2013. So he's racing again. Um, I don't know what that means. I don't know if he's like seriously back or just dipping his toe in a little bit. But uh, it's, it's always nice when there's a, a blast from the past. Uh, so, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's what's going on. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know, Brett. Like, what, I don't know what you think of these meets in terms of what excites you. But um, I generally like it when there's breakouts from uh, swimmers who are lesser known. You know, the bigger names. I don't expect Simone Manuel is going to be that fast. She normally swims fast in the summer. But I remember it was a pro series about well two years ago when when this girl here, Lydia Jacoby, sort of destroyed everyone, and then she went on to win the uh, the Olympic gold medal that year uh, mm -hmm. in an event. That you probably know about Megan, the the hundred breaststroke. <laughs> hundred breast, yeah. <laughs> I don't think you ever did a breaststroke, did you? Oh, uh, I think uh, I think I raced Liesl, who I used to train with, like in a fifty breaststroke. But I had fins on, so that was mm -hmm. about as close as I got to breaststroke. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. know much about it. Yeah. Well, it's good to see Simone Manuel coming back. I think uh, that's that's kind of exciting, right? What do you think about that, Megan? Yeah, it's really cool. Um, I think what I don't, I'm not too sure about like um, the American system too much, but in terms of like taper and, and January swimming, um, I know that we used to do a little bit. Um, our state titles are in like December for Queensland, New South Wales is in January, February. So I'm not too sure what the USA swim is doing, but are they rested a little bit or are they kind of just mm -mm. No, full no, workload? No, yeah, they've come out of Christmas training, basically, which generally is like a, the biggest block, you know, that, that yeah. any any group would have. And primarily because it's focused around, you know, college swimmers, right? Like the, the college swimmers generally go through this massive block and they'll go on this like Christmas training, they call it, uh, where they go out and, and basically build team. But it's, it's just kind of this period between you know, this, this Christmas break and the start of the new uh, calendar season, you know, in January where there's, there's a couple of weeks in there where you don't want to give the swimmers two weeks off, you know, college swimmers having two weeks off is, is tragic. So you go and do this Christmas training. And so a lot of these uh, pro athletes are in these college programs. So they get kind of lobbed in at the same time. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I guess that's where the, the specificity of, you know, having, having a program where you can go in and get the type of work that you need and then not just be lobbed in with a, with a college team. So, but generally I'd say most of these, most of these athletes are coming off a massive Christmas training block. Um, so yeah, taper would, would be the furthest thing from their mind. But um, Sonny, there was this kind of, uh, you know, this argument the other day online where they were talking about, um, you know, I think, I think Bob Bowman, actually brought it up where he was talking about racing dual meets in suits, you know, like it's the thing in America is you never raced a dual meet in a suit, right? Like you have one team racing against another team. And it was always like you go in and you just race in um, your regular training suits. Right. But now they're talking about dual meet uh, that about, you know, uh, racing suits. And I know that at these tier meets, they definitely race in suits. So what's your opinion on the future of this? I, I guess I feel quite strongly about this sort of subject because I like racing suits, hence the name. But uh, 
you know, I've not been part of the NCAA system. I've not done a dual meet. And, you know, I can hear the arguments for these meets are just about racing and having a good time and teamwork and all this sort of stuff. But when we're talking about high level athleticism and, you know, swimming at the top level, then a suit is a, a vital part of, you know, preparation. And, you know, I know that when I've coached at the top level, we suit up at least once a week in training for, you know, the serious part of the season. And I know I'm not alone in any way with that sort of thing. And, you know, you can just see the social media presences, presences of these top NCAA programs and they're, they're suiting up as well. But then they come to a dual meet and they don't suit up because it's tradition. And, you know, I know we both have fun with Twitter because people just love to give, you know, poor opinions. But so many people argued that they're too expensive, these suits, and, you know, their college program can't afford it. And I kind of just said, well, the, talk, the, the, the you know, the athletes we're talking about, that Bob Bowman's talking about, they're, they're the athletes like Leon Marchand, who has more than one suit that he can suit up. And these big programs, they can afford to, to suit up, you know, for dual meets. It's just it's not a question of money. And when it comes to just actually getting better at swimming, then it's a no brainer to wear a suit. Yeah. What was your opinion, uh, Megan? Um, yeah, I had a little um, look into this. I saw Bob Bowman posted and uh, there was so many replies. I couldn't get through like the first you know, mm-hmm. third of it. But um, I'm a big fan of suits, um, especially being a female. So um, you know, like, a, a, and a backstroker, I think for my hips and my legs to be able to sit up and, and on that um, kind of uh, line to get, you know, to get that little bit of a buoyancy. I used to love that feeling. Um, but also, I'm, I've never been in NCAAs. I've never been in a dual meet. So completely different system um, in Australia. So I don't know if I can weigh in on that, but I'm, I, I would support um, suits for sure because I think the more times you can experience that racing kind of quality um, you know and, and the faster you can swim why not um, if everyone's on the same level playing field then I, I just don't I think it's a no-brainer as well yeah but what about these this theory of, of like you want to save your best swims till the end of the season you want to have massive drops at the end of the season it used to be that like oh I could I could drop two seconds in a 200 right like that that idea of like oh, train hard train hard work through this and then at the end of the season you're going to drop two seconds now it's almost like swim as fast as you can and and almost you know drop a couple of tenths or even just repeat what you've been doing in season so this this mentality has really shifted from these massive drops at the end of the season to racing fast all year and kind of maintaining at the end of the year maybe just getting a couple of tenths drops right megan yeah, I think though, like it depends on kind of who you ask and who kind of made up that that kind of rule, right? Is that tradition or is that how some people want to swim it or is that how everyone swims it? Um, I think it's a very individual kind of uh, thing to ask someone if they want to have a big drop or if they want to um, kind of be consistent through the season. Or And also it depends, I think, on where you are in training. If you're coming in um, and you're – you know, you've been flogged all week and you haven't got any taper behind you, that suit might give you a little bit of a assistance, but it's not going to, you're probably not going to produce PB. So that's, you know, where the end of the season or um, depending on which ones you're going to target, that's where you get your bigger drops. Um, I think, you know, I think it's a very individual thing, but um, yeah, I, I think the USA have got a bit of a different system to us. So <laughs> I get yeah. a little bit confused. I had to look up what a dual meet was. So I'm a little <laughs> bit behind that all. All that was, stuff. Was there ever a, a chance where a, um, a college coach came over and talked to you and said, hey, we want you to come swim for us? Did you never go through that? No, nah, never. Really? Absolutely never. No. Nah. Wow. Someone someone screwed up there. There should have been some, <laughs> some recruiting. I would have loved it. I would have been on that first plane for sure. Yeah. I, I thought that someone may have just tried that and then you went to your coach and then they just shot it down because there's a, there's a lot of negative kind of uh, connotations with, you know, swimmers leaving Australia and going to America. But um, anyway, um, Sonny, I, I did have, I, I think I saw you say something where you were like, uh, you know, well, the freshmen come in and they might not have the suits. So what they could do is just get a suit from someone yeah. who's been for a while. Um, that, that doesn't really happen in America, mate. Like if you give someone a suit, they're not giving it up. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I think I was just talking to the programs that, seem to make such a fuss about getting suits. First of all, I mean, 
I found a suit from a brand in America that's brand new and it's fifty dollars with bonded seams. It's like it's cheap. Secondly, I, it was more just you know if you if you're worrying about money, you can be frugal. It's it's a thing, and it's more so every freshman coming in has multiple suits. I mean, both of you are eighteen. You know, it's not as if you had zero suits from the last ten years of your swimming. You know, so if you just care and put enough effort but I, I know in the uk we're different to america you know we never get a suit handed to us unless we get a sponsorship or something you know we have to buy our suits from our first meet all the way through uni you know like no one maybe loughborough get one arena suit a year so we're completely different but i kind of wanted to go back to what what you, you asked megan about you know the peaking at the end of the meet but I think not wearing a suit almost just protects athletes and coaches throughout a season. Because if you prepare properly for a season, then you should be peaking at the end anyway. You know, and also if you're not doing that and you choose between an athlete and a coach to swim fast all year because you want to do World Cups, ISL when it's on and stuff like that and make money, then there's every right to do it, you know. And I, I think that's on an athlete to, to choose what they want to be good at. If it's once a year to win the Olympics – or if it's or if it's once every month to win some money because there's so many athletes the tier pro series is going to put money on the line if you're an athlete who's not going to final at the world champs then why not go and win a few grand from winning a pro series like you know peak peak for this meet don't peak for the summer when you're going to come 23rd at the olympics or world champs or whatever it is yeah 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 that makes sense i get it uh well, it should be exciting to see what, what, what happens at the Pro Series this weekend. Um, where is it at exactly? I don't even know. Where, where are they doing it? I don't know. Uh, Knoxville. Australia. <laughs> yeah. That'd be good in Australia. We should, have, we should have some more meets in Australia, you know? That'd be fun. Yeah, but, it would be. So far away. We've it's got this guy, too Gordon. Far away. Sorry, we've got this guy, Jordan Crooks, from the 50 Freestyle this weekend. Uh, obviously, he just won in Melbourne. What do you reckon he's going to be like long course, guys? I mean, 50 freestyle, that's Brett, that's kind of your uh, forte. But uh, I, mm. I can't, I really liked, I really like the guy. Um, really good, obviously, underwater, um, really good starts, really good turns. Um, quite like his technique as well. I think, I, I think he's had a bit of rest over Christmas. I don't know what his training is like, but 53, I reckon long course, he's, I gotta, I, I'm going to, Say he's going to go pretty well. Twenty-one seven or faster in the fifty-three. That's I'll call it twenty-one six. <laughs> that's give him a that's give him that's give him a little bit of love. <laughs> twenty-one six. Okay. All right. We'll see what happens. I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Look, I think the kid has tons of potential. Obviously, we just had his coach on podcast last week talking about his training, kind of breaking it down. Um, the stuff they're doing at Tennessee is is brilliant. Uh, and it sounds like they're mixing in long course work into their weekly schedule. They're doing three or four practices a week long course. So hopefully Jordan is starting to figure out the long course as well. Obviously, he's got the underwaters down. And and sometimes that can be a bit of a crutch to to these short course swimmers, right? They just get stuck on that and they think to themselves, well, that's that's my skill. That's my forte. That's what I'm good at. And they don't put the time and energy into figuring out the, the length of their stroke, the tempos of their stroke, the rhythm to really hold it up on a, on a long course swim. So I think this is exciting for Jordan. He's in a, he's a, he's a young kid um, at the start of his career. He's obviously got some weapons, um, but if he can figure out that length in the 53 to maintain that speed, because ultimately we know in the 50, it's the person that slows down the least, right? So if you can get on your length, if you can hold water up top, He's going to have a he's going to have a lead at the fifteen, um, you know, through his breakouts, and then uh, then it's just a matter of maintaining. So yeah, it'll be really interesting to see. I guess uh, there's some predictions down here. Alex uh, is predicting twenty two zero. Okay, we're just throwing out times now. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I gave him I gave him a bit of love. I gave him a pretty fast time. Yeah, well, you know, look. Ultimately, what we really want to see is someone go under 21 seconds, Sonny. And uh, I think I put up a, uh, a clip last week of you and I kind of talking about that 21 second barrier. Um, he's he's definitely one of those these kids who's got the potential to get down there in the future and and uh, challenge something like that, right? I think so. But 
Also, I think his actual PB right now is 22-2. So, you know, he's got to drop, he's got to drop 1.3 seconds to do that. And I mean, just looking at his progression curves for the last couple of years, it's clear that he's on a great trajectory. I think going into World Short Course, his best time was like 22-1 short course, and he went 20.4. So no, 20.3, yeah. sorry. So it's not like this kid isn't capable of drops. I just think when you look at him until the turn, he's kind of level with a few other guys. It's only the turn that makes such a difference. Mm. That's that's not me saying he's not capable of being the best ever 50 freestyle long course. I just think, you know, there's 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 pieces he still needs to that puzzle. But he's, he's 20 or 21. There's no way that he can't ever do it. Uh, I just don't know. I think from another standpoint, uh, one of the British lads, Lewis Burris, who's training down in Perth, he is like the complete opposite of of someone like Jordan Crooks. He was 21-7 long course at the Commonwealth Games, and he has no start, no underwaters, but on the surface, he's the quickest in the world right now. Um, and he was 20.9 short course, but he's someone who, when they get to the long course ball, that that drop short course to me is super, something super exciting. So, you know, there's there's so many other people that are capable. He's the same age. And yeah, he's he's a he's a swimmer, not an underwater kicker, which I, I think bodes better for long course. Yeah. Hey, uh, something that I just thought of here, I was looking at Ryan Murphy's name actually in in the, the, the sheet of racing this weekend. And Ryan Murphy is obviously, uh, you know, a stud world leading backstroker. But his real challenge comes from the Russians. What, what's the status of the Russians this year in 2023? Are the Russians racing internationally this year? Uh, so as far as I know, the Russians could enter the tier pro series as long as like the USA let, let them like Minikov has raced uh, in American meets this year. And there's been a range of the Russian and Belarusian meet, uh, swimmers who have raced, you know, abroad. They just can't race at World Aquatic Championships, uh, European Championships, Olympic Games. And there's just been that's, no that's still a definite, definite ban. It, just been, it's, it's, it, the ban is kind of like never ending as far as I know until someone unbans them, which I guess will be when Russia stop attacking Ukraine. Megan, you got any thoughts on this? What's your thoughts here? Um, I mean... Be careful. You're over in the Russian territory, so... I, I know. That's, that's, I'm very close. I'm very close to that border. Um, I know. It, it's a hard one, you know. Like, to get banned, just... I, I, get, I get it. I get all that, and I'm not going to get political or anything, but... Some some of them are, are really quite innocent and they just want to swim, right? And it just happens to be that they obviously were born in Russia and, and that's their country. And some of them are passionate about it, and some. So I think that's quite hard. But um, I I don't really have too much to say on that one. I think yeah. if they're banned, they're banned. You know, like that's kind of what the world is going through at the moment. So um, yeah, I, I guess they're going to have to just hold on to that and, and see what happens. Never ending ban, huh? It's okay. a tough one. Never ending ban. Right. <laughs> uh, what else then, Sonny? What else is coming up that we need to talk about this week in swimming? It's pretty it's a pretty quiet week, really. Yeah, I, I think um other than America, nothing's going on. You know, there'll be no meets in the UK really until April trials. There's a few meets in Europe at the end of the month. I think there's the Luxembourg Euro meet, which will probably, you know, entice a few big names. But I mean, the reality is is that not much of it matters anyway. You know, Katie Ledicky could set a world record in January because she's done it before. But other than that, a lot of the, the top names who are racing at this this meet this weekend could be two or three seconds off their PB, and ultimately it means nothing. You know, and that goes back to the whole debate we had earlier of when it when 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 it when you peak, it matters, and the best guys have that clear focus. That is Paris, and slightly lesser. World Championships in Fukuoka this year, so um, you know we can have fun watching it. Um, but yeah, ultimately it's going to be: will there be a new new name breakout? Will there be someone who starts to make a push for the USA team this 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 uh, summer? Maybe Daniel Diel, the uh, the backstroker lad who's been going like fifty three lows at like sixteen or seventeen. He, he's a, he's a cool name to watch. Yeah, for sure. Um, another thought I just had, Megan. Um... People on this show love uh, workouts. They love tough sets. Can you think of a, uh, a tough 200 backstroke set that you would do on the regular 
that uh, got you feeling good, got you in shape, got you confident, whatever it is. Any any 200 backstroke sets that you remember? Yeah. Oh, God, actually gave me a little bit of goosebumps. Um, that pain is just a different feeling. Uh, I think it was a Monday and a Thursday afternoon set. So Monday afternoon was um, like your lactate tolerance um, and your Thursday was kind of uh, lactate as well, but more sprint based. So I was trying to get a little bit more speed. Um, so Monday afternoon set would probably be Monday and Thursday would be our toughest sets. Um, I'm just trying to think our Thursday set. I definitely know. Um, so we used to go 1650s um, best average. Uh, they'd be on either one about 130 or 145. Um, and 200 backstroke, or obviously my lactate would probably not produce until about, uh, you know, higher lactates, about nine or 10. So between, you know, 10 and 16 is where I was pushing up. And I think my PB for lactate was 17. So I think that was pretty hard mentally, I think, because in a 200 backstroke, your legs just fill up with lactate with about, you know, on that third lap, um, 25 to go on that third lap, and you're just trying to hold on for that fourth lap. So 1650 is best average. Um, and what are you holding was, during that time? Uh, depends on a good day or a really crap day. <laughs> on a good day, probably back then, I was hoping to, you know, 30, 30 point lows or 30.2s to about 30.7. Um, so if I could do that, I'd be you know, pretty happy. Anything under that was a bonus. Anything over that was probably like a back end speed. Um, so, you know, it wasn't, wasn't great. The lower I could get in those thirties, Bowley would be uh, pretty happy. Um, so yeah, 1650s best average was a Thursday afternoon special. Um, and that becomes like physical and mental. So it was always a mental battle. Like, can you go again? You know, you've absolutely, about number 10 or 11, and can you push through that pain barrier? Can you hold on to your technique? Can you mentally push through, um, still hold water and still go as fast? Um, so I really quite liked that set because it was both mental, uh, mental and physical. Uh, Monday night sets, um, a little bit more aerobic in there as well. So we used to go a 150. Uh, it either could be freestyle or, um, freestyle or backstroke. You get to choose. So whatever I was feeling pretty good at. So usually 30 beats below max and then you'd have a little bit more rest depending on what it was and then a 50 max so pretty much like a broken 200 so 30, um, 30 beats below for 150 and then a 50 max and we'd go anywhere between you know maybe six or seven times um so that was that was a bit of a solid one as well mm. on a monday night um i remember having uh so we used to bowler used to like to do we used to like to do 12 100s um and four four and four so 12 100s four at would be usually 40 beats below four at 30 beats below four at 20 beats below or backstroke um so that one was a pretty pretty solid set good maybe on two minutes 215 so you're getting a little bit you know a pretty solid rest um but yeah that was a favorite of bowlies and a bit of a favorite of mine 12 ones four four and four so you're coming down by your heart rate um and hopefully you're coming down by um, times as well so that was yeah that was a, a pretty tough one but yeah 1650 is probably my favorite one best average pretty classic sets there Sunny uh nothing that I haven't really heard before but you know the way that she's doing them obviously is uh at that elite level right yeah absolutely I I, I find nothing more exciting than watching elite swimmers do hard sessions and just challenge themselves I, I love the grimace of working hard. I love the satisfaction when they know they've done a good set. And I, I, I just love the motivation that you can do as a coach as well. Like I, I just absolutely love it. And I, I just, I love that connection a, a good coach has with a good swimmer in terms of just extracting that little bit of extra effort out, you know, um, in a set like that, 1650s. What, 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 a, what a beautifully and simply written session, eh? Yeah, oh, that's it. it. You know, what's what's the magic of Bowley there, Megan? Where oh, you know, he's, he's on the deck. What's, <laughs> what's he doing doing a set like that? Bowley's famous saying, right? So 1650s, and he used to say, um, capitchy pitchy, which means don't capitulate too early. So he's like, don't spend all your bickies in the first four, you know, the first 450. So he's like, if you want to capitulate, you're going to go out so hard. And I just, that's all I have in my head is capitchy pitchy. He used to say it all the time. And 
I used to say a few more, you know, things I probably can't say on here, but um, <laughs> Bowley is probably the number one motivator. Um, he just gets, and he's very good at individuals. So he'll know what makes me tick and he'll know what, you know, someone mm. like Steph Rice or someone like Kenny Monk or Nick Darcy, he'll know what makes individuals tick, which I think makes a really good coach, right? You know, mm. not everyone is the same. So, um, yeah, he used to say just some, you know, subtle things and it just get you. You'd just be at the end and you'd just be like, oh, that made me angry or or you'd just laugh and, you know, it was it was pretty funny. But I think, like you said, the, the beautiful thing about 1650s is I used to like watching everyone else as well because everyone else is on the pain train, you know, lactic acid, who's going to give in first, who's going to absolutely capitulate and not be able to finish the set, um, who went out too early, who hasn't, you know, who's been a hero on the last 16 you know, who's going to be the hero that drops a second on the last 50? Um, so it's always, and, you know, you have a few heroes in your squad. So um, it was always a Thursday afternoons. It was always a good one. And at the end of the set, like you said, it's just that feeling. If you did a good set, you know, it's just a feeling you can't really, um, I'd like to bottle it up and, and drink it every now and then. It'd be good. But it's, um, it's, a, it's a pretty cool feeling once you do a good set. Yeah, Absolutely. I agree with all that, and uh, I could I just picture Bowley on the pool deck. You know, he's he's a classic. Uh, I love watching the best work too. So, um, I got an, I got one more question for you before we let you go. Um, well, it's a two part question. So, are the are the Campbell sisters coming back this year? Um, I think I I don't want to ruin their maybe comebacks. I think Kate's pretty much in the water again. Okay. I see her. She went on a six-month uh, little European tour. Um, she did some commentary with Channel Seven for the Commonwealth Games, which she did, you know, amazing straight off the off the bat. So she did pretty good. And I see her getting back into her rehab. Though, like, she, she wasn't as good as you with that. No, nah. <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> uh, no, she. I mean, she was doing some post-race interviews, which is. I think it's the scariest part because mm-hmm. it's like she's still fresh on the team, you know, like she's still – she's asking her friends questions, mm. which is really hard. It's not like you've – I've been away from the Australian Sim team since 2014. So, um, you know, some of these people don't maybe don't even know me, but it's quite hard asking, you know, your friends and, and teammates questions, especially if they don't swim very well. So um, props to Kate. She did – you know, she did an amazing job and she's um, a bit of a natural through that. But – I see her back in the water. She's got a goal of 2024. Um, she might be the first ever person, not even male or female, um, to go to five Olympics. Five Olympics is far out. That's um, that's. It might be special. She might make it. She might not. But um, she's got a lot of courage going for it. Bronte uh, is in Europe at the moment. I saw. I think I saw her skiing. Uh, maybe in. I think it's. Maybe Canada, I think it was. So I'm not too sure what um, Bronte is doing. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't really seen her in the water, but um, Instagram's a funny one. Who knows what happens <laughs> if it's true or not, all the good stuff on Instagram. Yeah. But um, I, I'd like to see both of them. Um, I'd like to see Kate, if she's going for it, absolutely smash it and be the first Aussie to go five Olympics. All right, second part of that question uh, before you go, who wins the 100 freestyle at the trials? For the women this year, I'm going to say Molly O'Callaghan. Mm. I like her. I like her a lot. She's um she's got mad skills. She's got a really really good start turn underwater, like off her turn. Um, she has a cheeky little look and she goes on her side and she's um got a really nice technique. A little bit short on the stroke, but um she's and she's young and she's so fearless. Um, I think it's going to be a nice little battle though between her and Emma. Um, but I think. Just think, Molly's got a. She's just got that age on her side a little bit. Not saying anyone's old, but um, I think, yeah, I'm going to say Molly's going to win it, and she's, she's going to be in prime for the next two or three years. So I think um, she's just kind of arrived on that at, at that world stage. I like that call. I love it. All right, Sunny and I will debate that as you leave. You've got to run. I know you've got a <laughs> lesson to get to. So uh, yeah, I got a swim lesson. <laughs> uh, appreciate you dropping in. Thanks for thanks for coming. And uh, that thanks for having me tomorrow. All right, take care. Yeah, All right, sweet. Sweet. See you guys. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Well, Sunny, I like that call there. Uh, Molly O'Callaghan for the fastest female hundred freestyler in Australia this year. What do you think? I, I I like it for another reason, and that's that she finishes fast. And 
I just think there's a mental thing for being the guy that chases down or the girl that chases down. Just it's, it's, there's a there's a pro to it, and it really puts pressure on the person who's going to take it out fast, which will be at the Australian Trials. Emma, Emma will turn first at fifty, and she'll know she's probably got like point six of of lead, and that point six can be eaten up by Molly. And I, I think Emma's a great winner, hence you know all the gold medals she's got. But you know. It's it's a thing to have that corner of your eye, Molly coming back in like twenty six two or whatever she does, which is just absurd for a woman. That there's a lot of pressure that comes with it. But mm. also, ultimately, if they could both get top two, they both swim it at world champs anyway. And so, does it really matter who wins the Aussie trials? It really matters who wins the world championships because I think it's going to be one of them two as well. Well, you we're saying that, and here we are now talking about Kate Campbell coming back. So, like. You got Kate Campbell standing up next to these girls all of a sudden who've had a year off from her, and now they've got to face her again. Kate's motivated; she's ready to come back. Um, you know, so you got to put her in the mix, don't you? Um, these these top swimmers they can come back and they can be great really quickly, especially you know after the mental break and what that provides. Um, and and I just think it's really like who's going to be on that Australian women's relay team as well because if Kate Kate can take someone off the team who's top four in the world. You know, these Australian girls on their day could go probably one to five with Kate Campbell, one to six in the world with Bronte, which is why they're so far ahead. But then also, when we get to world championships, the Americans will be good. There'll be other, there'll be other swimmers that are good. Sarah Strostrom can be good. You know, she's another one who's having a little bit of a break right now, not, not racing, but she'll be around in the mix as well. Um, and her and Kate going head to head is like one of the most exciting races ever. Like they're they're brilliant, brilliant mm. races. Yeah, well, young Molly O'Callaghan's having something to say about that. Now Fonzo thinks that Molly's going to be an Olympic champion. Paris, how about that? Yeah, I, I, on one hand, it's like, well, it's hard to say no to that. But then another another hand, it's that's a year and a half's time right now, and predicting anything for eighteen months' time in swimming is, is so difficult because think about how quickly someone like a Popovich and Molly O'Callaghan comes along. You don't know about them. And six months later, they're winning medals internationally. And it only takes one more absurd talent on the women's side to come through. And, you know, it could be a 51-5 from a girl we don't even know about right now in a year and a half's time. You bring up a good point there, 51-5. Now, are we going to see a woman in the next Two years, let's say, between now and Paris or at Paris, are we going to see a 50-point 100 freestyle? Not long course, no. Why? Because no one's fast enough. And I think it goes back to the chat you had with James in terms of 22-point for a women's 50 freestyle. But we're still only having a handful of girls go 23 um, and even less doing it consistently. You know, the world record's 23-6-8 from Sarah. Um, who's focusing less on 100 now anyway. I think Emma's been 23-7. Penilla's been 23-7, and she's now retired. So, you know, even girls like Molly O'Callaghan, they're, they're heavily limited by how fast they are. I'm not sure what Molly's 50 freestyle PB is off the top of my head, but I think she's probably 24-5, 24-6 at best. Well, you know, even if she goes out in, right, to feet, 25-0, that's her PB to 50 with the flip, 25 to feet, she's got to then come back in tw 25 points, go 50 point. No woman's ever come back in 25 point. So you can rule her out going 20, 50 point unless she can suddenly muster the speed to go 23 point, which is another whole training and another whole ability. So I, I think we need to get at least 23 lows before we talk about 50 point. Yeah, and that really kind of pulls her out of maybe the uh... – the 200 freestyle where she's really strong too. Yeah. So it's, it's not, not saying that you can't do all three. Yeah. It's just very difficult to do all three that well, where yeah. you're talking about, you know, 23 mids, 50 points and, you know, 152. So like uh, that, that's a whole different story. And that's where, you know, even a guy like Popovich uh, hasn't figured that part out yet. You know, yeah. he hasn't got his 50 freestyle down to the point where he can be competitive in that either. So um you, you mentioned a name there that kind of went under the radar, and I think we, we haven't even really talked about this, is Pernille, uh retiring from uh, swimming over over Christmas, I think, effectively, kind of just uh, 
you know, it went under the radar. So we just, we lost a legend uh, the last couple of weeks, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a, a real sad one because obviously a, a, Olympic champion, right, in the 50 freestyle, like it's not even a little loss. And obviously the, the power sprint couple of the world, Panilla Bloom, Florent Manadou, um, you know, both Olympic champion 50 freestylers, but Flo's still swimming. Uh, Panilla's decided not to, which I, I think it kind of, comes back to what a swimmer is good at you know like certain swimmers like your bends and your flows and even your sarahs they can get away with not doing much i don't know panilla personally but i can only imagine if she could still do flows training and be the best in the world maybe she'd keep going maybe she needed a little more maybe she needed doubles you know and or maybe she just had enough she's she's olympic champion that you know you you earn your right to retire at that point right yeah well not only is she olympic champ i think she's you know she's won you know, Europeans and, and world medals. I mean, she, she's pretty much done it all when it, when it comes to the swimming side of things. Um, she's going to go down a legend in her country. Um, you know, she's, she's, she speaks well. She's a good-looking girl. So it's like she, she'll be very successful outside of the pool as well. You know, she's got sponsors and she's got, you know, probably speaking engagements. And, um, you know, she does a really good job of kind of on her Instagram you know, connecting uh, with an audience as well. So I think, look, she's got life out of swimming set up for herself, which I think is half the battle sometimes with a lot of swimmers, like we talked about, is figuring out what you want to do next. So she and she's also engaged to to flow. You know, so there's a there's a wedding coming up sometime in the future. I don't know if it happens before Paris or or what. And then and then imagine those two actually starting to start a family. You know, imagine imagine a little. Uh, little offspring of those two sprint legends i mean Matt, we're talking about you know some some genes uh, the gene pool at the highest level there aren't we i i think if they have twins one one boy one girl mm, i mm. can just see it 18 mm. years from now whatever mm. the olympics is 2040 or whatever they just both win the 50 freestyle i can do <laughs> i can just see something outrageous that the manadu kids um oh, yeah. yeah like yeah Flo, Flo is built like no man I've ever met. Mm. And Panilla's obviously got the fast twitch fibers and the, the genetics to be awesome. Yeah. Um, talking to Panilla, I don't know if you remember this. One of the most awesome races I, I, I mean, ever I remember is, I think it was the European champs, maybe 2018. And Sarah wins the 50 freestyle by like 0 0.01. And then in the semifinals of the 100 freestyle, Panilla attempts to not only break the world record on the first 50, but also make the final in the 100. And unfortunately, she comes up just short of both. I think she, like, hand touches 23-8 and yeah. then goes, like, 54-0 and, like, ninth. Doesn't make the final. But I just remember being like, that's the sort of stuff that needs to happen more often. And she got – I think she got a bit of backlash for trying to do it. And I was like, how cool would that have been if she set the 53 world record mm -hmm. and then made the final of the European champs? Like, And she was, like, point one off doing both things. Like, yeah. insane. Yeah, brilliant strategy. I love it. You know, there should be more of that stuff out there, but uh, that's what that's where Ben Proud should be doing some of that stuff. Does Ben yeah. does Ben Proud uh, try and make the relay team for Paris at all? You think he doesn't because it, he he doesn't want to. He just wants to win that fifty freestyle medal. That's 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 all Ben wants. You know, I think he's he's starting to become a similar position to Bruno was leading into Tokyo, where he's. He's been that maiden fourth or fifth so many times. He's won most other things. And like, if anything, he's done more than Bruno in terms of he's won every other meet there is to win. Like, like outright won it. He's world long course champ. He's world short course champ. He's European long course champ. And he just hasn't even got that medal at the Olympics, which ultimately is kind of all that matters. And that's why Bruno celebrated that bronze, you know, you know more than me, like, like it was the best thing ever. Um, and I think Ben would be in the same position if he can, I'm not saying he's not, he, he wants to win. Of course he wants to win. But I think if he comes away with a silver and a bronze, he'll be, he'll be happy. Um, and I think the relay just takes so much more training. Like he's capable of 47 long course splits, probably similar to Bruno as well. Like Bruno was capable of them 47 long course splits, but, Ultimately, did it take anything away from his 50 freestyle? Maybe maybe it didn't. I think in Ben's case, it definitely does. Um, but ultimately, that men's GB team is is in for a medal now. You know, that they're, they're, they're a dark horse for that bronze medal in the 4 by one team. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's going to be some good racing. Um, I just had a random thought 
What, whatever happened to the kid that won the 400 free at the Olympics? Half now he where where's he gone? So I, I wanted to bring him up because he's actually racing the Tier Pro Series this weekend. Oh, okay, um, there we go. So what happened is he and we, we commentated it live, and we said about how he's going to be like attacked by Indiana staff to try and get him to to, to recruit him, and he then like a month later announces he's going to swim for Indiana. But for some reason, I don't know school stuff in I don't know NCAA school stuff. His grades aren't good enough to compete. So mm-hmm. he's training in Indiana right now with Ray Lewis and the, the staff there, but not competing in NCAAs. But he is representing Indiana at this meet. And this will be his first sort of competition since mm-hmm. being a Hoosier. And he's racing a whole range of events. He's doing the, the 800 freestyle on the first day, going up against Bobby Fink. Mm-hmm. Um, what else is he in? Uh, let me see. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, he's, he's racing a few events, I think. Uh, he's got the, the 400 freestyle against Kieran Smith, Bobby Fink, Zane Grote. Nice. It's a pretty stacked field. Um, and the 1500 freestyle against Bobby Fink again and Michael Brinegar, where I don't know if you, you remember, but he won the, he won a medal at the last World Short Course Championships in like 1412 or something. So he's pretty good at the 1500 as well. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, well, good. Well, finally, we're going to get to see Hafnawi back in action. I feel like I haven't called his name in a while so let's uh, let's get him going again so we may have to we may have to watch this tier pro series this weekend sounds like there's a lot of action going on down in tennessee eh? yeah i look, I, I love watching racing and there will be some fast fast races i mean i I, looked, I just looked at the woman's 50 backstroke and there's there's quite a few resurgences like the woman's 50 back has a uh, olivia smaliga so she's racing again i don't know if she's been on a break or we've just not heard of her but Obviously, she's a world champion in this event. She's up against Kira Tassant, who's obviously swimming at Tennessee with with uh, that great staff there. Catherine Burkoff, who's like maybe the quickest in yards, if I'm not not mistaken. Kylie Mass, Regan Smith. Like, what a field for the 50 backstroke there. Like, um, I think there's going to be some really good races. And it's always going to be that case of someone people are in hard training. Some people, I mean... Clearly, people like Jordan Crooks, who, you know, someone mentioned here, he swung really fast at a dual meet in a speedo last week, whatever that means. But he's only off the back of World Short Course. And if he had a break for a week, you know, maybe he's just riding out the speed a little bit. So maybe he's going to be pretty good here. Um, or maybe he's been putting an absolute ton of work in and he's knackered and goes 22-5. It, it's, it's kind of always that what's going to happen, right? Well, listen, I'll tell you, it was always difficult for me in short course season to have a long course mentality and just get the the rhythm and the stroke. Like you're putting so much emphasis on finding your rhythms and and finding your, you know, like the the short course yards is all about, you know, pop, 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 flip, pop, 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 flip, you know, like that's a whole different rhythm, you know, like, so, you know, switching back and forward between the two styles and mentalities is is almost impossible you know you can't it's very very difficult to be brilliant at both at the at the same time so you know his focus right now is short course yards i would imagine you know a lot of people saying that he's going to be this and that and I, i'd imagine he's probably not going to be as fast long course as people yeah. would think but um but just getting in some long course racing is always a good thing you know well wait when you coached at Auburn and, or even when you swam at Auburn, did you like to do long course meets like in January or would you not want to touch long course until March? NCAAs right. is gone. And- I hated it. Hated it. Yeah. I mean, I was awful actually, you know, um, I swam, I swam at Auburn for 97 to 99. So I did, I did three seasons. Right. And, and we always had our long course Australian championships mm-hmm. a couple of weeks, maybe a month after NCAAs. And I would always tank. I'd go home to Australia and I would absolutely tank. I just couldn't switch my mentality from this short course race into all of a sudden, boom, long course. Um, Now, look, a lot of these programs are doing some long course training in season. I think that probably helps. We didn't do that at that time. So that was part of my decision to actually go back a year early and leave college and actually try and make the Australian Olympic team back home in Australia. Cause I had, I had to switch my mentality. That was really what it came down to is like, I'd missed a team three years in a row. And I was like, well, I can't miss the Sydney Olympics. The only way that I can possibly get there is to go home, have a fixed mentality on long course racing, which ultimately was the right decision and, um, and help me perform at the highest level. But 
really, really difficult to go back and forward between these mentalities, um, you know, in season. So as a coach in NCAA, I'm guessing like your sort of uh, focuses professionally are all NCAA based, right? That's that's your job is to, to be successful at the NCAA. So if you're someone like Josh Crooks' coach, your focus is not for him to win world championships, it's to win NCAAs, and then anything else is a bonus? Or, do you, you know, what I'm if someone like Jordan Crook is like, look, Josh, I get it, we're NCAAs, but I, I, I'll, all I want is a medal world long course this year. How, how does that sort of conversation come about? Or, or how do you reckon that sort of thing works? Look, I think when you've got the individual swimmers, that's where your individual focus might be. You've got someone like Jordan who can compete at the highest level, <clears throat> you're going to give them that leeway, but you're not going to give that to 30 of your athletes. Mm. You're not going to say, hey, everybody, we're flipping our mentality and we're all going to try and swim as fast as we can long course because it's not relevant for everybody. So, like, yeah, that individual swimmer who's got uh, a chance to be really good on the world scene, but that doesn't affect your whole team. Now, yeah. if, if you know, Matt Kredich was to say, hey, we're all going to have a long course focus and we're going to tank the NCAA season – I mean, he would, he'd be out of a job. Like, that's yeah. not his job. His job is to compete for SEC championships, for NCAA championships, and he's paid really well to do that. So that that's their job. There's no way around it. It doesn't matter what the world of swimming says. Oh, why don't you focus here? Why don't you focus that? Because the university's paying him to swim really fast, short course yards, and that's it. And so, yeah, the... the the coaches will have will will say to a, a special athlete, okay, we'll we'll just kind of shift our focus here, knowing that that special athlete can be fast either way, right? Like yes. they, they, they're going to be able to show up because they've got the talent, they're, they're doing the work, they'll they'll be fast enough. Like I I had that with um Matt Matt Target for instance, Matt Target in two thousand nine, we win the NCAA title as a team. But he'd just come back from Australia competing at the Australian Championship. So, like, literally he had three or four days back in the country and then he suited up and raced again. So, like, he went back and, and competed, um, you know, and then and then came and, and helped us win a, a national title. So that's kind of the mentality that you'll have with, a, with an individual swimmer, but not a team mentality. Yeah. yeah. No, that makes sense. Uh, I, I kind of just, while you are saying that, I kind of was thinking about, if you had a, the same team and you prepared all year long course, done a long course meet and then went in some yards versus the other way around, you, you prepare all year yards and then go into a long course meet. Surely the, the former, and I know, again, it's not the point anyway, but the form, like off the back of a long course meet, you know, take Caleb Dressel after he's won multiple gold medals at the Olympics and you throw him in a yards pool. Surely he's going to rip some fast times. Whereas maybe if you took him after the 17 six and you put him in a long course pool, his his rhythm would be all over the place. Or are you not buying that at all? No, I'm not buying that either, mate. It's all it's all based on the rhythm and timing, right? The timing of your turn is crucial. If you mm. if you haven't got that timing down, if you're in a long course rhythm, you're coming out of the 15 meter breakout and you're getting into a flow to get to the 35 meter mark, you know, 35 meters mm. of swimming, and you're in a flow and a rhythm, you're not thinking two strokes turn, you're thinking rhythm, 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 hold your length it's a completely different mentality. Yep. And so like you're going to get swimmers jamming their walls, you know, yep. head, head button the wall and, or maybe touching with their toes, like, and thinking to themselves, Oh, my, my rhythm's all out. Right. So um, it's, it's a massive difference between the two and it really just comes down to rhythm and timing. And that's just something that takes time to put in yep. to get that. So no, I, I don't buy that either. No, that, that, that's interesting because I think like the most popular sort of debate I see, and even when people are talking about how America should maybe handle doing a short course meet of trials for Worlds, they were like, stick it after like long course target meet of the year. So stick it after World Champs because everyone's fast, everyone's tapered. But, um, you know, it's quite interesting hearing you say, well, that doesn't really work because they are, and they are, they are super different events, you know. Um, and I, I guess that's the reason you can, like my going back to the whole suiting up thing, I think not suiting up. It, I think it protects sensitive athletes. And and I, I saw Bruno actually reply like, "That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard." And I wouldn't personally do it, but I, I still think there's a mentality between like, hey, "It's all right, you went, you know, slow because you didn't have a suit on." Where and that is why you can go to a long course meet like the Pro Series, put a suit on, and it doesn't mean anything because even if you even if Jordan Crooks bombs this weekend long course. It's okay because he just went 199 butterfly on a relay yards in a training suit. So it kind of irrelevance 
you know, long course doesn't matter now. It doesn't matter yeah. until post NCAAs. And that's why you can go and suit up at a long course meet, but not at a dual meet because there's less mental pressure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, based on, on the times that Jordan was pumping out, let's have a look at these again, you know, and, and what he's doing. Look, it is exciting when, when this kid does eventually suit up and taper short yeah. course yards. I mean, wow. Uh, you know, I was actually on the pool deck, standing on the pool deck, and I watched Caleb Dressel go 17-6. And I thought to myself, uh, I, I I need to retire from college coaching because I'm never going to see anything like that again. You know, like it was just one of those moments where it's like, that's it. I've I've seen everything I need to see. You know, 17-6 is just so far beyond. But here we are now, you know, a few years on, and a guy like Jordan Crooks could actually get get down to this level. Um, you know, and a guy like Bjorn Siliger, you know, he he's another potential who can get into the 17 mark. So maybe. Maybe it might be the season where we see a couple of guys actually uh, pop 17s in the 50 freestyle short course yards. And, man, wouldn't that be another step forward for the sport of swimming? That would be fantastic. Yeah. I, I think it's just a matter of time before it happens as well. Like, once someone opens the, the pathway, other people will go. But it's always the, the question is how long will it take? Because you could have said that in 2009. You know, 20 point happened and – here we are 13 years on and no one's made that step. And I, I think the 17 point step will be taken quicker. I think Jordan Crooks, I think he'll do it this year. Like I think he's been 18 two now and I think he's got every tool in his arsenal to go 17 point. Um, yeah. And I think that then ultimately just says people say 17.63 could be the best swim ever. But I'd say, well, if someone does another 17 point in three years, well, that means 20 point is the best swim ever, isn't it? And that's why long course is the, is the pinnacle of swimming. And, you know, we've had athletes like Dress will go 21-0 twice, but still not go 20 point, you know? Mm -hmm. And 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 that's the that's why it is the ultimate task. And that's why it's a world record long course is the most ridiculous thing. And I actually, again, slightly off topic, Sarah Showstrom still has four long course world records. She has the 50 free, the 100 free, the 50 fly and the 100 fly. Like she has the most individual world records out of anyone in the world right now, along with um, I think along with Katie, but Katie has relays. So, you know, it, oh yeah. Individual. So that's crazy, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look, you know, she's, a, she's a legend of the sport who actually coaches her. I don't know who coaches her anymore. Um, she's, uh, she's with the Swedish team um, at the national center. I think it's in Stockholm. And it was, so their, their head coach until, uh, last December left and it's a new young guy I think he's only a couple years older than me late 20s early 30s um, and Sarah loves him she says he's brilliant he's novel he's new he's fresh um, yeah she, um, we both joke like it was a bit of a joke because both Sarah and Chad were o older than their coaches there you go um, wow wow what, whatever happened to um, the the Swedish girl Therese Ashima what, what happened to her husband he was he was coaching right yeah, so I th I think he what I I met Therese and her husband at the uh, at the Man Austin this year. We had, we had breakfast together one day. We yeah. sat with Sarah, and so I, I think that was Sarah's coach. And right. But it's yeah. now the assistant. I, I don't know if he's taken a step back, and the assistant has moved into that more full time role, and and he's sort of just overseeing things. But as I said, he was at the Man Austin. I, I just don't know if he's taken a slightly more reserved role with it. All right. Okay. All right. Well, listen, mate, uh, there's absolutely nothing going on in swimming and we've, we've managed to talk for an hour. So we've done pretty good. <laughs> I, think, um, I think this show's a, a hit, mate. Wait, wait till some swimming starts and then we're going to really have a lot. Of fun. <laughs> well, yeah. Next Monday will be pro series to debrief. Yep. Debrief pro series. Listen, uh, th there's a bunch of people in the live chat right now. Thanks for your comments and questions. We love posting them. Um, you know, uh, I didn't get to this one here. Let's have a look real quick. Uh, short course last year. Do you reckon you can shave off half? As I, I don't, I don't doubt anything Popovich can do. So like, um, yeah, I, I mean, I reckon he could do anything. Uh, I, I did put up something the other day and somebody, somebody kind of said, you know, somebody respectable, an Olympic athlete, I won't mention the name, did say that they're not, they're not big on his technique. Uh, his his freestyle technique. They think that's one of the things that that's holding him back. Um, you know, so I, I I don't know. Look, he's he's young enough and smart enough to figure those things out. Technically, I think he's got a great feel for the water. He's got obviously, 
that endurance that he can hold on to his length of his stroke. So, look, you, you can always finagle the, the technical aspect of it to make it look even prettier, and I think that's probably what he'll be doing over the next few, few seasons. I, I just think, you know, to question his technique is like people that question P- Pouchoneri's technique. It's like yeah. it's not an aesthetic thing, but – Clearly, what Pouchoneri does for a 1500 is super effective. You know, it doesn't have to be majestic and perfect and angular and all of these things that we we blueprint. It just needs to be fast. And therefore, if Popovich is the fastest 100 freestyler ever, how we question his technique? That's not to say he can't improve, but come on. Like, his technique has to be doing something right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, it's been good, mate. Thanks a lot. Good chatting. We'll we'll catch up next week. We'll have a lot to talk about. See you later. See you. Thanks. Thanks for coming, everybody.